Good morning and welcome to Faith Christian Fellowship. I'm so glad we could see meet in person again today. We are going to praise our Lord this morning, so uh, let's sing to our Lord today. Worship our King this morning. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. the grave, you free every captive, then break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lift me high, oh God, you have done great things, praise him this morning, he's done great things every day. been faithful through every storm. We'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Tell him this morning. And I know you will do it again. For oh, your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great Oh, God, hero, oh, hero of heaven. You conquered the grave, you free every captive, and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Darkness has to retreat. We 
don't have to live in darkness. Hallelujah. With just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. With just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Hallelujah. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every again people hallelujah just one touch I feel the power of heaven hallelujah. And just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that he can move we'll praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do There's nothing that our God can do There's not a prison wall we can't break through Or place a name That makes a way There's nothing that our God can do I will believe the greater thing Will you believe for greater things? I will. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Come on, let's sing it together today. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power. There's nothing that our God can't do. It's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. It's not a prison wall He can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. us through them to shape us and mold us. 
How are you going to react to the storm? How are you going to respond? Don't react, respond. Hallelujah, Father God. You are worthy. You are so worthy.
in your name we find healing in the name of Jesus our Lord and Savior hallelujah thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus that you are our foundation our foundations built in you you're our life you're our victory we love you we thank you that you have redeemed us you have restored us I thank you Lord Jesus, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, Father, we just lift up those in authority over us in any way. And, Father, we thank you that they answer to you. We just commit them into your hands. Soften their hearts. Cause them to turn their hearts towards you. And, Father, enlighten them. Cause them to make decisions that will glorify you and will be a blessing to those that they serve. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you were raised from the dead, you caused every captive to be set free. You caused the sick to be healed. You caused those that were bound by sin and addictions, Father, to become righteous and free in you. And so, Father, our eyes are on you. We look to you with great expectancy in these coming days. We know that you are the author of every good and every perfect gift. It comes from you. It comes from above. And I thank you, Father, as we're dealing with whatever we're dealing with, we just cast the care of every worry, every anxiety, every situation, every problem onto you. And we know through the finished work of Christ that you have sent your word and you have healed us, you have delivered us, you have freed us, you have prospered us, you have blessed us. And we thank you for it. Your favor surrounds us like a mighty shield and we receive the fullness of your triumph now in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we do the confession, I want to read a section out of the Christ the Healer book by F.F. F. Bosworth. And he says it better than I can say it. A spiritual law that few recognize is that our confession rules us. It is what we confess with our lips that really dominates our inner being. Hebrews 4.14 says, Having then a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. This is the confession of our faith in the redemptive work that God wrought in Christ. I am told to hold fast to the confession of the absolute integrity of the Bible. I am told to hold fast to the confession of the work of Christ in all its phases. I am told to hold fast to the confession that God is the strength of my life. I am told to hold fast to the confession that surely he hath borne my sicknesses and carried my diseases, and that by his stripes I am healed. God says this, and we are to believe and say the same things. We are to know what our rights are as revealed by the word and then hold fast to our confession of those rights. When you know that Christ took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, hold fast to your, confes to your confession of this truth. When you read, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, hold fast to this confession. We are to hold fast, of fast our confession of what Christ has done for us in order that it may be done in us. We are to hold fast to the confession of our redemption from Satan's dominion. We are to hold fast to our confession in the face of all contrary evidence.
God declares that with his stripes we are healed. I am to confess what God says about sickness and hold fast to this confession. I am to recognize the absolute truthfulness of these words in advance of any visible change. I am to act on these words and thank him for the fact that he laid my sickness on Christ the same as he did my sins. Healing is always in response to faith's testimony. Some fail when things get difficult because they lose their confession. Disease, like sin, is defeated by our confession of the word. Make your lips do their duty. Fill them with the word. Make them say what God says about your sickness. Don't allow them to say anything to the contrary. Believing God's word with our heart implies our having put off the old man with his habit of judging by the evidence of the senses. Faith regards all contrary symptoms as lying vanities, as Jonah did, and puts the word in the place of the senses. Our only problem is to keep in harmony with God's word and not allow the senses to usurp the place of the word. We cease to agree with doubting Thomas, who says, except I shall see, I will not believe. We are to prove Christ's own words, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. The word is lifeless until faith is breathed, breathed into it on your lips. Then it becomes a supernatural force. Make your lips harmonize with the word of God. Christ's high priestly ministry meets our every need from the moment of our new birth until we enter heaven. Why are we to hold fast our confession? Because Christ is the high priest of our confession. Because he is a great high priest because he is a merciful high priest, because he is touched with the feeling our, of our infirmities, because he ever liveth to make intercession for us, he is always ready to give us grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus is the high priest of our confession, our success is assured. When you confess that by his stripes I am healed and hold on to your confession, no disease can stand before you. Just thank the Father and praise him whenever a need confronts you that is covered by redemption, and it is yours. Faith is thanking God from the heart for healing that has not yet been manifested. We are as sure of this as if it were manifested. The confession of your lips that has grown out of faith in your heart will absolutely defeat the adversary in every, in every conflict. The word will heal you if you continually confess it. Nothing will establish you and build your faith as quickly as confession. Confess it in your heart first. Confess it loud in your room. Say it over and over again. Say it until your spirit and your words agree. Say it until your whole being swings into harmony and into line with the word of God. And the Father, or the Lord, spoke to Kenneth Hagin years ago when he read uh, Mark eleven twenty three and 24, and it says in there, what we say three times and what we believe only once. So he told Kenneth Hagin, you'll have to teach the people about the saying part three times as much as the believing part. And that's the tough part. We can often believe in our heart but to say it out loud and to speak it out loud, as we speak these confessions out loud, our faith is actually built. Our faith starts in our heart, but it, then it develops and builds from there as we speak it, because we hear it now with our ears, and you know we're hearing the word over and over again from our own lips. And, but that is the tough part. Sometimes we just read it, and then we walk away. And um, the saying part and the believing part go hand in hand, and we have to do them both. So as we do our confession together, let's concentrate on what we are saying and keep saying it and keep declaring it until we're rooted and grounded in God's word more than what we see or feel or our circumstances want to say to us. Let's do our confession together. I am blessed. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am loved, I am healed, I am free, I am prosperous, I am talented, I am creative, I am confident, I am secure, I am disciplined, I am focused, I am prepared, I am qualified, 
I am determined. I am equipped. I am empowered. I am motivated. I am valuable. I am anointed. I am accepted and approved. I am not average. I am not mediocre. I am a child of the Most High God. I will become all that I was created to be. Do you believe it? Amen. Then keep saying it. <laughs> Father, we just thank you that we are redeemed, that we are healed, we are blessed in every way, and you are the Father of all blessings. You forgive all our iniquities and you heal all our diseases. You redeem our lives from destruction. We give you honor and praise and help us to confess your word more and more and over and over again until we are rooted and grounded in you because that is when we build our house on the rock and not on the shifting sand. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good word, Vern. It's absolutely the truth. We never rise above our confession. I want to talk to you today about God's restoration. We've been in a mini-series emphasizing that God is a restoring God and he's in the restoring business. God is able and he is willing to restore us. Last week we talked about the importance of having our mind restored, having a restoration mindset. And that begins when we begin to thank God for his word that gives us a hope and a future that is better than our present circumstances. We talked about the ten lepers, how that they were healed as they went on obedience to God's word, but one of them returned to give thanks, and the one that gave thanks was made totally whole. There was no trace of leprosy, no trace that he'd ever had any sickness or disease. And so one of the ways that we stay in the place of faith is we stay encouraged that God is good in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. He is the one that is looking after us. And so when we encounter loss, when we encounter difficulty of any kind in our lives, many times it's so easy to feel discouraged. So many times it's easy to feel down. But God never promised that we wouldn't have unfair situations. He never promised that we wouldn't face trouble. In fact, he said in his word, in the world you have, will have trouble, you'll have tribulation, you'll have uh, discouragement, you'll have opposition, but be of good cheer. You think, well, what for? How could we be cheerful in situations like that? Well, it goes on to say, because I have already overcome the world, I have deprived it of its power and ability to harm you and that the world uh, the the flesh the enemy do not have the power to rob us of what god has in store for us and so many times we're not expecting anything better because of what we're experiencing right now but the good news is god is a god of restoration and no season lasts forever seasons do change and if we will stay in faith God will restore all that has been taken from us. Joel 2.25 promises that. Now some of you maybe have lost your joy. Maybe you've lost your peace. Maybe you have lost your vision. Maybe you've lost your dreams. Maybe you have lost hope that things can improve. And many times we experience loss because of what other people do. They make choices that affect us. You know, maybe a spouse walks out on us or a close friend betrays us. And other times we experience loss, we experience hurt, we experience shame because some of our own poor choices. We, we make decisions that we shouldn't make. We get around the wrong people and then we begin to develop habits that turn into addictions and bondages. But... We've got to make sure that we don't get down on ourselves and beat ourselves up and, and feel that there's no hope. You know, I made my bed, I'm just going to lie in it. No, God's a merciful God, God's a good God, and he wants to bring us out of these things. And then there's other times that things happen just because we live in a fallen world. I mean, a loved one passes away. 
uh, a sudden illness comes our way. It's just part of living in this world. There's death in this world. Satan's the god of this world system. And you and I have to realize it's not the things that happen to us that keep us from enjoying God's best in our lives. Many times we think that's true. Last week, we talked about how Moses, who at 40 years of age was a prince in Egypt, which was the greatest empire in that generation. And he was very privileged. He was very successful. Uh, he was very influential. But he saw a fellow Israelite being abused. And there was something that rose up within him because he had this call on his life to deliver God's people that he went and took that Egyptian aside and he killed him and buried him in the sand. He tried to fulfill God's plan and purpose in his own strength and in his own ability. And he ended up running for his life as a fugitive, living in the backside of the desert in Midian for another 40 years. And at 80 years of age, with the loss that he had experienced, I'm sure he felt very uh, discouraged because of the choice that he made. But you know, God restored him. God spoke to him. And at 80 years of age, he began to lead a nation of slaves out of bondage right into freedom. So just think of all the people throughout the scriptures that, that were saved, that were delivered, that were healed, that were raised from the dead, that were supernaturally helped. If God did it for one, he'll do it for anyone. Do you know what God does in the Bible for one is a revelation of his will for all of us in every situation. And so what he's done for another, he's well able to do for you. He wants you and I to be convinced that he is a merciful God, he's a kind God, and he's a faithful God, and he's a restoring God. In fact, we're going to look at the life of Job, and before you get discouraged, the life of Job is not just about his boils. The life of Job is about overcoming loss, overcoming sickness, overcoming heartache, overcoming disappointment, overcoming tragedy, overcoming what life throws at us. And uh, we need to know that it's more than the boils. You know, a lot of people, they know about Job and his boils, but they do not know about the stripes of Jesus. The boils of Job cannot help us, but the stripes of Jesus will heal us. And they have healed us, and they will continue to heal us. In fact, God is such a restoring God that we learn through, through the story of Job that the, the enemy will have to pay for touching God's property. God will make the enemy pay for all the trouble he brings into your life and into my life if we make him pay. But we have to hold him to it. We have to send him the bill. We have to invoice him. That he is an intruder and he has no right to steal, kill, and destroy and to do what he's doing. See, Isaiah 61 7 says that God will give us double. He gives us double. That's, that's all I'm going to read of that. Thank you. Instead of our shame, he's going to give us double. Now, the enemy will bring us shame. Sometimes our poor choices will bring us shame. Sometimes other people will treat us in such a way that they'll shame us. But God's our redeemer. Vengeance is his. He brings us honor. He brings us double. He brings us out to a better place. In fact, he'll bring us out stronger and better than it was as if it had never happened. The enemy would be sorry that he ever touched us because God will bring us to a level that we would have never got to if we hadn't have been attacked. So I just want you to recognize that God is good. The scriptures in Job 1 introduce Job as the most influential, the, the richest, the most wealthiest, the most powerful person in all of the East. And he was that way because God blessed him because he was a God-fearing man. He wasn't a self-made man. He was a God-made man. And he loved God. He was blameless. And he had, he had no desire 
for evil. He had no desire to do anything wrong. And he was blessed. He was blessed in the city. He was blessed in his house. He was blessed in his business. He was blessed in his health. He was blessed in his marriage. He was blessed in every single way. And the blessings of God were chasing him down. And of course, we're talking about the Old Testament. And the, in the Old Testament, Satan would come before God and would accuse God about God's people. And he came before God one day and he said, He's, no one that serves you serves you for nothing. And what he meant by that is, the only reason that anybody follows you is because of what you do for them. In other words, he was accusing God's people of having prostitute faith. That the only reason that we have anything to do with God is because he gives to us what he can do for us. It's not because we love him from our heart. It's because we can use him as our, uh, somebody that looks after us. He provides for us. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Oh yeah, he says, I've, I've seen him. But I tell you one thing. If you would remove that hedge of protection, you know, that God's favor sounds just like a shield. The everlasting God, uh, the everlasting arms and hands of God are behind us. They're underneath us and they're all around us. The, his favor surrounds us like a shield. God's mercy and goodness follow us all the days of our lives. He gives his angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. Yes, there's a hedge of protection around us. Yes, when we put on the whole armor of God, we can quench every fiery dart of the evil one. So the enemy said to God, if you just remove part of that protection, I'll attack him and I'll take all of his wealth and he'll curse you to your face. God says, I don't think so. And so Satan went from the presence of God and he attacked Job and took all of his wealth overnight, almost virtually overnight. All his wealth, all his possessions was gone. And Satan come back with glee. And he said, uh, the people that follow you, follow you because of what you can do for them. Well, he says, have you, conserved my, have you noticed my servant Job? He still loves me. Yeah, but if you took his health and you took his family away from him, not, not you took him, but you allow me to take him. Because God doesn't take our wealth from us. God doesn't take our health from us. God's the giver of life. And Satan, well, you can touch him, but you can't have his life. No, we're, we're talking old, old covenant. Satan went out from God's presence, took his family, took his health, took everything he had, yet in all these things, Job never turned his back on God. And so the, the, the point I want to make is Job didn't know that there was an unseen force that was attacking him. It's amazing to me. He never lost his hope in God, and he didn't even know that it was the enemy stealing from him. You and I need to know that our enemies are faceless. That we're dealing with an unseen force that is defeated and whom we have complete authority over with the name of Jesus. Whether it's Old Covenant or whether it is New Covenant, one thing remains the same. Satan hates God. And Satan is trying to stop the Word of God that's been planted in your heart from producing in your life. And he'll use anything he can to steal the word from your heart so that it doesn't get on your lips. Because once it gets on your lips, God watches over that word to perform it. And Satan's work is stopped. And God's word increases. John 10, 10, you probably have heard this before. But this is about the thief. This is Satan. This is the deceiver. This is the liar. This is the one that Jesus defeated through his death, burial, and resurrection. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, if you have that 
understanding in your spirit and in your mind and in your life, you'll be ahead of 90% of the body of Christ. You'll understand what's from God and what's not from God. It is the enemy that has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Let's put it back up again and we'll see what Jesus' part is. The restorer. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it all the more abundantly. To the full, until it overflows. The Amplified tells us. And so, this makes it very clear that God is not the one that's stealing, killing, destroying, bringing guilt and shame and condemnation. That God is not the one that is going about ruining people's lives. God's not the one that is taking loved ones from us. God is not the one that's causing accidents and calamities and bringing tragedy into our lives. It's very simple here. That God is the restorer. He's the one that is bringing life. He's the one that is raising us up. I was talking to a young man just recently, and I asked him if he knew the Lord, and he said, yes, I'm born again. And I says, well, why aren't you going to church, and why aren't you on fire for the Lord? He said, because my mother died of cancer, and I'm offended with God, I'm upset with God. Why did he take her? Because he didn't. You see, Satan works day and night to get us to th think that God is the problem. Are we going to trust God to restore us if we think he's the one that is bringing tragedy and shame and sickness and disease and divorce and anger and division in our lives? Are we going to trust the very one who's our enemy? No. So the enemy tries to get us, get the roles changed. And he was thinking that God took his mom. And he's hurt and he's bitter towards God. And in his heart he loves God, but he doesn't want to give himself completely to God. And I would neither. Who would want to give your heart to somebody that would treat you like that? Somebody that is out to take from you. Somebody that is out to destroy you. Take your loved ones. Take your business. Take your testimony. Destroy your self-worth. You want to serve somebody like that? You can sit down now. But that is the strategy of the kingdom of darkness. The, you know and I know multitudes of people that used to be in church, used to be on fire for God, but something happened. And they're mad at two people. They're mad at the, the preacher for telling them about God. And they're mad at God for allowing what happened to happen. Rather than trusting the restorer to give us double for our trouble. Trusting God to take what the enemy has brought for our harm and our shame and our hurt. And for God to turn it around for our good and his glory. God's well able to do it. He wants to do it. But he's looking for somebody that will work with him. And because of Satan's attack, Job endured every kind of devilish, demonic setback that you could imagine. He lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He lost his reputation. He lost his testimony. He... he he, he, he even was so marred with sickness and disease that no one even wanted to be around him. And, and it's just something about, I don't know why life is like this, but when somebody is successful, when somebody's influential, when they're down, it just seems to be everybody comes out of their cave or people come out of the woodwork to knock them down when they're down. I, I don't know what it is that we should, we should be looking at people 
that are up and help them to stay up. Do you, do you believe that? There's just, just something about it. And it just seemed to be that everybody, whether it was their relatives or whether it was their friends, and Job had three of his closest friends came to comfort him, in quotations, condemn him, belittle him, shame him, let him know that God was not happy with him and that God was responsible for the harm and the shame and the loss and the hurt and the discouragement and the frustration in his life. That's devilish. I'll tell you, with friends like that, who needs enemies? Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And, of course, we could go on to the rest. But the point is, people are not our problem. Does Satan work through people? Hmm. Has he ever worked through us? From time to time he has. That means that the challenges that we face in life are not directly the, resp the, res the result of what people do. Many times it's the enemy working through people. But so many times we're offended with people. We're upset with people. And what we need to do is we need to release people to God. Get to the place of peace and joy and let God deal with people. I think sometimes we don't because we think like Jonah. God sent Jonah to bring the gospel to the Ninevites. And do you know why Jonah didn't want to go? Because he thought that maybe God would, uh, would treat Nineveh mercifully and graciously and he did and Jonah knew he would sometimes I think the reason we don't release some people to God is because we know God's going to be good to them but God knows that the goodness of God is going to lead them to repentance and they're going to get changed and they're going to get helped and God if you do what's pleasing in the Lord's eyes the scripture says that he'll even make your enemies to be at peace with you in other ways it, it's it's an amazing thing that the very closest friends of Job criticized him and put him down and didn't support him in his time of need and this is where the enemy gets most of God's people knocks them out of the race but 3 John 2 says that any area of health and healing and prosperity is based on our soul. And so when we allow what happens, what people do or what we do or what happens in life to affect our joy and our peace and our mental well-being, we tie God's hands from restoring us and blessing us and lifting us and recovering us and renewing us and opening new, new doors of opportunity in our lives. We, we must recognize the importance of having a restoration mindset. You know, we live in a fallen world. Uh, you know, if you've been betrayed, you'll have to deal with betrayal. If you've lost something, uh, you probably feel no one understands what you're going through. But I want you to know, Jesus went through everything that you and I went through yet without sin and he's going to help us get through what we're going through and he's going to do it in a right way Psalm 23 says he restores our soul Jesus restores our soul which is our mind our will and our emotions the Lord can restore your soul through a trauma through a breakup through a discouragement through a bankruptcy uh, uh, through a tragedy, uh, through a divorce, through a loss of a family, uh, through loss of finances, through all the things that Job experienced, you can still have your soul restored. Job had his soul restored. He came to the place of peace. He came to the place of wholeness. Now, God emphasizes the end of Job. That's the point I want to bring out. Most people can quote all the stuff that happened to Job, but they don't remember what the end was. What was the point? Now let's look at the end of Job. Let's look at James 5.11. Let's look at the story of Job from the New Covenant, looking back at it. This is God's point of view. This is how God sees Job's story. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. 
In other words, the Bible says that when attacks come, put on the whole armor of God and stand. And having done it all to stand, what do you do? Keep standing. And then what do you do? Remain standing. And then having done all to stand, what do you do? Stand. Why? You endure. You persevere. Why? Because God's a restoring God. You know that God is going to see you through. God has never bailed on anyone yet. What God starts, he finishes. So indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You see, we, we inherit the promises of God through faith and, faith and patience. Patience just means consistency, perseverance. We continue on. You've heard of the perseverance. You've heard of the of, of the consistency of Job, the, the stick with itness of Job. And you have seen the end. This is the end. This is the punchline of the whole story of Job. You've seen the end intended by the Lord. What was the whole point of just allowing Satan to think that he was going to win in a losing battle? How can a loser win? Satan's a loser. And what was the end intended by the Lord? That everyone would experience and everyone would know that the Lord is very compassionate, very tender hearted, very gracious, very kind, and he's very merciful. That's the point that we learn from Job. And you know where Job, the, 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 that's the two points. Number one, if we're going to experience the God of restoration in our lives, we, we have to stand for it. You know, James says that we have, to res we have to submit ourselves onto God and then resist the devil steadfastly. Because the thief, the, the, the devil is also known as a roaring lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour. What's that mean? That he can't devour everybody. Only those who let him. Whom resists steadfastly in the faith. In other words, we just got to remind him, cancer, not here, not, not, in this, not in this house. Divorce, not here. Lack, not here. We're in covenant with the unlimited God. So God emphasized the, the blessing of God. The compassion of God. And anybody who has ever received anything from God has had to stand for it. Has had to fight for it. And we're not talking fight in the natural. That we don't hang by our fingernails. We fight the good fight of faith. Why is it such a good fight? Because Christ has already fought it and he's already won. We enforce the victory that's already been accomplished. That's what we do. We don't magnify what the devil did, but we want to magnify what God did for Job because what he did for Job, he'd do for anyone and, and all of us. Now, Job opened the door to the devil because he was in fear. Now, uh, how many have read the first chapter of Job? Anyone here? Well, the first chapter, you'll notice that Job had seven sons and three daughters, and because he was kind of uh, well healed and he was influential, uh, the, the, his family didn't have the same drive. They were kind of, every night was a party. Every night was a new feast. And they would take turns, depending which translation you read, they would take turns hosting who was going to have the feast, in quotations. And then they would invite the, the, the seven sons, then they would invite the, the three daughters of Job to come and they would eat and drink and just just have a merry old time every day and Job was so concerned about it that he would offer sacrifice after sacrifice if you're a parent you know what that's like you think oh God I'll do whatever you want me to do you know help them and what God wanted Job to do was just trust that he would work in their lives and and when when they were lost Job says, the thing that I greatly feared came upon me. When we get the bad report at the doctor's office, many times we're, we're doing good till we get the bad report. And then all of a sudden we get the bad report and fear comes. 
See, the enemy, fear attracts the work of the devil, just like faith attracts God's restoration power. Sometimes people say, you know, I'm going to go to the doctor, believe that I'll have a good report. Well, sure, I want to believe that I have a good report, but we have to stand on the report of the Lord regardless of what the report is. God's report doesn't change. We can get a bad report, and God can fix things regardless, because He already has fixed it. We believe the report of the Lord, and we are not going to open the door to fear in our lives. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Does that, does that mean that we ignore what's, what our kids are doing? Or does that ignore what's happening in our body? Do we just, do we just um, deny what we have problems? Do we deny that we're kind of messed up a bit? Do a little dysfunctional? No, we don't deny it. But that's not what we focus on. Our focus is on God. God, we can't change ourselves anyway. We can't change our family anyway. We can't change what people think about us anyway. Only you can do it. We, we, we trust you. Say, he's a restoring God. He's restoring, God. He's restoring me. He's restoring Job 42.10. This is a, a good one. And the Lord restored Job's losses. When he walked out on his friends. When he told everybody how his friends never supported him. When he told everybody how they betrayed him. That's easy to do, isn't it? But what, what's the hard part? When he prayed and interceded for his friends and committed, gave them to God. And then God gave him twice as much as he had before. I'm sure that the devil, Satan, the, the steal, the one that steals, kills, and destroys, I'm sure he was sorry he ever had messed with God's servant Job. Let's make the enemy pay. Ever heard the story in, the, I believe it is Numbers 21, where the Israelites were uh, giving God a hard time? kind of dumping on him and that he was the problem and all these kind of things. And There had been snakes and serpents and fiery, you know, all this stuff going on in the desert all along, but God had been protecting them. But you know, they told God, we don't want anything to do with you. And you know why? We, should, we were better off before when we were in the world, when we were serving the enemy. And, and, and God removed that hedge of protection. The snakes began to bite them. And, and then all of a sudden they got spiritual and started calling out on God, help us, help us, help us. And he told Moses, put, get a pole and put a serpent on the pole. That serpent is a, a type and shadow of Christ taking our sickness and diseases. If you will go to a doctor's office, you'll notice many times the serpent on the pole stands for our healing. It's already done. And the people that looked on that serpent on the pole, which is a type of the finished work of Christ, if they would look on that pole, they would be healed. As many as looked were healed. In our time of trouble, let's make sure that we're looking not at ourselves, our, our mistakes, the mistakes of others. We're not mad at the government. We're not mad at our neighbor. We're not mad at our spouse. We're not mad at people. We got one enemy. Say one enemy. one enemy. He's a defeated enemy. And he's under our feet. Let's keep him there. And let's keep our mind, let's keep our focus not on what people have done or haven't done, not on the mistakes that we've made, but let's keep our focus on him, on the Lord. That's what, that's what happened to Job. There are people that God, that Somebody walked out on them 20 years ago, and they're still bitter about it. The, all of hell rejoices when we're like that. No, we can't do that. And it works for nations, too. I was reading about the nation of Korea, how that Japan had come in, and they had overtaken that whole land, and they made the... They made all the people go to school and learn the Japanese language. They couldn't speak in the Korean language. 
They made them serve the, and worship the Japanese gods. They took the resources out of that land and they raped that land. They stripped that land of everything and they tried to indoctrinate the Korean nation into their ways. But you know that they prayed and they forgive that nation of Japan and now Korea is a, is a powerhouse nation? They never got focused on what was, what was wrong. They got focused on the one that is the God of restoration. It works for individuals. It works for nations. And just the last point, and we'll close with this. God is a God of partnership. God doesn't do it all by himself. Job would not have got free just if he had just been if he hadn't have prayed for his friends. God needed somebody to operate in faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. And I'm just, we won't put up the scriptures, but I want to share just with the prodigal and the son. Actually, the, this uh, father had two sons. They both had issues. But we we're talking about the prodigal. He was a young man, very entitled, didn't have the relationship with the Lord that his father had. And he asked dad for his inheritance because he thought, I might as well enjoy the inheritance. I'll enjoy it while I'm young. And because he was a farm boy, he was innocent. He wasn't streetwise, you know what I mean? He went to the big city, got a lot of new friends. And uh, in no time, he lost all his new friends, lost all his money. And he was down to nothing. And where was, all, where, was, where was the fun? And when he was down to nothing, he was so hungry. And here's a Jewish boy. He was so hungry that he was about to eat the, the slop, the pig food, that he was feeding the pigs. That's an embarrassment for a Jewish boy. That's as low as you go. And the Bible says, maybe we can put that one up, uh, Luke 15, I believe it's 17, when he came to himself. Then he came to himself, when he came to his senses. What I'm talking about is a partnership. God couldn't help him until he turned. There wasn't anything God could do for this young boy, even though God loved him. With all of his heart, the young man had to turn his heart towards God. God wasn't asking for much. He just asked him, I want you to turn. See, repentance is always the first step. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. As soon as he came to himself and decided that he was going to make a turn, he realized, hey, you know, I thought I knew what fun was. I thought I knew what life was all about, but I realized I didn't. You know, see, the, the God of this world system blinds our eyes so that we cannot think straight. We think what is right is wrong and what's wrong is right. And until and, and no one can make us see it. Only God can open our eyes and give us understanding. And sometimes we just have to experience it for ourselves. Uh, God has no grandchildren. And this boy lost his money, he lost his reputation, he lost his innocence, he lost his dignity. But God restored it as soon as he came to his senses. And sometimes we just got to come to our senses. God, even if it's our own mistake, even if the decisions that we made were poor choices and we're in the mess because we're uh, of the choices we've made, God still is a merciful God. And it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. If we'll just turn to him, he'll still restore us. He's not holding anything against us because what was against us he put on Christ and took away from us. And as soon as this young man got up and to return to his father's house, everything changed. And of course, the, to make a long story short, he was restored to his father. But you see, God couldn't do that all by himself. And the boy couldn't change himself. It was a partnership. It's a working together. God's got a part, we got a part. We must believe, and we must make the turn that we're, we're trusting him. 
uh, one person was telling us just a little while ago that uh, they had a, they knew of a, 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 a couple they were having trouble in their home and the, the dad was an alcoholic. And he made a lot of promises that he'd quit drinking. He wouldn't drink the money away every week. But he couldn't come through with it. And finally, she sh locked the doors, changed the locks on the doors. And like the prodigal, he had to come to himself. First of all, he, he turned back to God. And then he turned back to his family. And God took him right back. His family took him back. He was totally restored. That's the kind of God. He is a merciful, compassionate God. It doesn't make any difference whether we're in a mess because of what people have done. Or because of poor choices that we have made. Or whether it's just living in this fallen world, God doesn't care. All he wants us to know that he is a God of restoration. And he's going to look after us. And he's going to take care of us in grand style. He's for us. All God's looking for is our cooperation. Let's not get soured on life. Let's not get discouraged of what's happened. Let's recognize that God sees it all. He knows it all. And if we'll just shake off the guilt, shake off the condemnation, we can come to him just as we are, and he'll look after us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a restoring God. You're a good God. Thank you for turning our captivity and restoring our fortunes. Thank you that your mercy and goodness follow us all the days of our lives. Thank you that our last days are going to be greater than our former days. Our best days are right in front of us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're good and you always do good. And that you always make a way where there's no way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.